Our mathematical problem now is to minimize over all n vectors x the 2 norm of b minus a times x. b is an m by 1 vector and a is an m by n matrix. We could state this as ax approximates b. It's an overdetermined linear system because we have more things we're trying to do than we have unknowns to do them with, and we're solving it by a least squares criterion. The best known solution for this, that's important both in theory and in practice, is called the normal equations. These equations are actually pretty easy to derive. So let's suppose x and z are any two n vectors. Well, we can plug them in to b minus a times vector. Let's square that 2 norm so that we don't have to carry around a bunch of square roots. So the 2 norm is, of course, linked to inner products. So we can write it as the inner product of these two vectors. And then we'll just do simple distribution of that product. So we get the product of the first two minus the first times the second, and so on. Now these two, if we look carefully, are in the form of v transpose u and u transpose v for the same vectors u and v. But this is just a scalar inner product. And for real vectors, it doesn't matter what order you put the vectors in. A dot product is the same, no matter what. So really, these two things are equal and we can combine them into a single term. Now again, using properties of two norms, this first term is the two norm squared of b minus ax. And the last term is the 2 norm of a times z squared. Now this being the norm of a vector squared, we know it's always greater than or equal to 0. So now if we look at this middle term, and we choose x to make this part 0, then that goes away. And this thing that I started out computing is really just the sum of two separate norms squared. So that's greater than or equal to norm of b minus ax squared, no matter what z is. So our conclusion is, if we want to make that thing on the left as small as possible, choose z equal to 0. You can't do any better than that. That means that x is the thing that actually minimizes the residual. So that's what leads us to define the normal equations. It's that thing that made that middle term vanish. We could also rewrite it as a transpose b is equal to a transpose times a times x. And if we use associativity, then this thing on the left is just an n by 1 vector. And this matrix is just an n by n matrix. So the normal equations are really a square n by n linear system of equations for x. Right away, there's something important to point out about the normal equations. If the rank of the matrix A is equal to n, then this A transpose A that appears in the normal equations is a symmetric positive definite matrix. Now, in case you don't know or you've forgotten, rank A equals N means that the column space of A is n-dimensional. Or another way of looking at it is that those column vectors are linearly independent. It's something like non-singularity for a rectangular matrix. So now we're ready to talk about an algorithm from the normal equations. So first you compute this matrix A transpose A. Then you compute the right-hand side, A transpose B. 
and then you solve that n by n linear system using Cholesky factorization since the matrix is positive def symmetric positive definite. In terms of the flop count, the first step, just a product of matrices, that's 2 times the outer dimensions times the inner dimension. Same for step 2, 2 times the outer dimensions times the inner dimension. And then the third step with Cholesky is 1 third n cubed. So asymptotically, we have to consider two terms, not knowing the relationship between m and n. Now, out of the normal equations comes a new idea called the pseudo-inverse. Since A is a rectangular matrix, we cannot write A inverse ever. That's not defined. But there is something close. Since we have a way of mapping B to X, if we call this whole matrix A plus, or A dagger, we could call that the pseudo-inverse of A. It's the thing that solves the problem where you're um, finding the least squares solution. The size of the pseudo-inverse is n by m. And it's easy to check that a pseudo-inverse times a is the identity matrix of size n by n. However, unlike the regular inverse, it's not true that a a plus equals the identity although it does have the right size, m by m. I'm going to demonstrate the normal equations by a least squares fitting problem. I'm going to generate the data artificially this time. So here are some equispace time values. And then I'm going to use these three functions to generate my data, as well as my fitting matrix. So the data will start with a linear combination of those three functions. And then, so that I can't fit the data perfectly, I'm going to perturb it by a fairly small amount. Next, I'm going to set up the matrix. So the columns of the matrix are evaluations of my three functions at all the different time values. So this matrix will be 400 by 3. And since I'm using these same three functions that I used up here, right, the true solution should be pretty close to the 1, 2, minus 1 that I used in the first place, with a small perturbation because the data was changed a little bit. First, I want to look at the condition number of that matrix. It's about 20. So I'm not going to see a big effect due to ill conditioning, right? That's going to happen out in like the 14th or 15th digit. So I form the normal equations matrix right hand side. I could use a Cholesky factorization to solve this by hand, but here I'm just going to be lazy and use backslash, which does the same thing. Then I compute the residual vector, and I see that in fact the difference is about this 10 to the minus 3 that I used to generate the data in the first place. So that's how close a linear combination comes to approximating this perturbed data. If I look at the solution itself so that I get the coefficients of the three functions, well, they were perturbed somewhere around the fourth or fifth digit, again, because we perturbed the data in around the third or fourth digit. And if we use the built-in backslash to just solve the problem from the beginning, you see the answers agree out to the last few digits. Now there is a big drawback for using the normal equations, and that's an issue of stability. It's a little bit complicated. So first of all, the easy part is that we can generalize a matrix condition number. For a rectangular matrix, it's norm A times norm of A plus. So you just use the pseudo-inverse instead of the inverse there. Here's where it gets more complicated. If the residual that you get is small, so this is the thing we're trying to minimize, and if you're pretty successful at that, then this kappa of A is the condition number of the least squares problem. So that's similar to what we saw for linear systems.
But now when you think about the normal equations algorithm, well, the first thing you do is to make this matrix A transpose A, and that's what you solve with. So what really matters to the algorithm is the condition of this solving step, which is the condition number of A transpose A, and with a little work you can show that that's the square of the condition number of A. So you see this might be much larger than the condition number of the original problem. So if the condition number of the matrix is big and the residual at the minimizer is small, then the normal equations are unstable. And I don't want to qualify what I mean by big and small. It can be done, but it gets a little messy. But what it essentially means is that the errors are too large by a factor kappa. Here's the fitting problem I did last time. I'm going to change things up a little bit. I'm going to change this function here by putting the coefficient very close to 1. So if you think about it, the functions sine squared, cosine squared, and 1 are all linearly dependent. By changing this a little bit, I get something that's quite close to that. So these columns will be nearly linearly dependent. That'll make the condition number get large. All right, and I'll generate the data the same way, and then I'm going to make this perturbation much smaller. So that's actually going to be less than the amount we're changing things with the condition number. Okay, so the matrix is set up the same way, and now we see the condition number is about 10 to the seventh. So when I use the normal equations, this is going to square that condition number and make it 10 to the 14th, which is quite large compared to machine precision. But it's still able to get an answer with a small residual. But you see now that the coefficients have changed quite a bit. They're kind of close to the 1, 2, minus 1, but only for a couple digits. Now if we compare that to the answer that MATLAB gives with the backslash, you see that they're quite different. So the normal equations, by squaring that, this condition number, introduce an instability. It's not able to find the solution accurately in terms of these three coefficients. This turns out to be much more accurate. However, you'll notice that normal equations did still give us a nice small residual uh, comparable to our perturbation size. And that's what we said about linear systems as well. In an unstable, that's what we said about linear systems that you can get a small residual even when the error is large.